So, hi, I'm Eddie. Um, this is XP Revisited. Hope you're in the right place. Uh, no females interested in XP. That's an interesting observation. Um, but yeah, just a quick, uh, quick kind of gauge for me, temperature check to see um, anyone here already doing XP? Anyone got any experience with XP? Okay, good. Because the, the, this is not going to be like for people who, if, if you had already been um, practicing XP, you probably wouldn't pick up too much from this. So this is all about the, the, the context of XP and what, we, what I believe we should be um, using it for. Um, <clears throat> okay, so and, and, and as it says here, rediscovering XP as a pathway to enhanced agility. This, uh, just a little bit about me. I'm a, an independent agile coach. I've uh, previously worked as a delivery manager, scrum master, and probably most relevant for this, uh, an XP developer, and that was quite some time ago. Uh, I've been working with Agile since 2004, which is when I discovered XP. Uh, I've used XP, Scrum, Lean, Kanban, and Scaled Agile methods, and there's a number of places that I've worked at. Uh, <coughs> quick couple of caveats before we get going, right? I mean, I've got a lot of slides to get through. They're all quick ones, so um, shouldn't be too too uh, tiresome, but um, I, I, if, if I start falling behind, I might pick up pace. If you need me to slow down, stop me, just raise the hand, that's absolutely fine. If we need to ask questions along the way, please do. If you want, if you want to just interject with a comment, please feel free to. There's only a, a, a handful of us here, so we can, uh, we can, we can have some conversations as we go. Um, yeah, I, I'm Irish, um, and I hide the accent well sometimes, not very well usually, um, but if you can't understand what I'm saying, just it gets worse as I speed up, so slow me down. Um, I will definitely be having a few digs at Scrum and Safe in particular. I don't mean to offend anybody. If you are a die-hard Scrum or Safe fan, um, then we can certainly have debate and discussion around it. And um, it doesn't mean that I think they're awful and they're the worst things. You know, they're not like the work of the devil or anything, right? But um, I just think that we need to uh, be a little bit more mindful about how we adopt them. <coughs> so. On with the show. Everybody ready? Strapped in? Let's do it. Okay, so this, this is uh, a comment from um, one of my earliest mentors in XP, an exceptional um, programmer, developer, taught me pretty much most of the stuff that I know about, um, about XP. And, uh, and this is the comment that, that, that he made. He said, um, as an industry, we're as, we're as good as we've ever been. So you know kind of let that sink in for a second like i mean 10 years ago it wasn't as good as it is now 20 years ago it wasn't as good as it is now okay we're, we're at the we're at the kind of the, the the zenith well hopefully we can keep striving on okay it's not to say that we can de declare victory we've not won yet or anything but but no one's had it as good as us um so i like that so i thought i'd open with it <coughs> um then i i kind of thought wouldn't it be amazing to get the notorious B.I.G. on a slide at a conference. So I put this up there. This is not about original gangsters, really. It was just about the original problem that Agile is here to solve or, or was, was kind of created to solve, which was, you know, we, we weren't able to do something. We weren't able to release software, build and release software frequently. We really struggled with releasing software. But as I say, you know, we're so awesome now. We're the best we've ever been. And uh, we kind of have solved that problem now. I mean, the patterns are, are, are in place. The, the patterns exist. Anyone who wants to learn how to release software in shorter cycles, build and, and, and deploy and release software in shorter cycles, um, you know, the, the templates are there. The, the patterns are there. We can do it if we want. Whereas, say, 10, 20 years ago, um, people didn't really have, there wasn't widespread knowledge of how, how to go about doing that. And that's why Agile came in. So great job, gang. That's you and everyone else in the industry. We've done well. Um, and so what really did it for us is framework adoption. So we've kind of we've brought in some patterns, some templates, some ways of working that help us to focus on known good ways of de 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 delivering software that reduce risk. Um, and steered us away from known bad patterns of delivering software that increased risk, okay? So things like working on smaller um, chunks of work, um, fewer items, 
um, shorter time scales. So instead of having a year long development cycle, we're looking at two week time boxes. Okay, so shrinking everything down, shrinking the problem down. <coughs> and that is kind of really um, at the core of, of how we've become uh, the best we've ever been. Right? Welcome. That's all right. <coughs> So I want to talk a little bit about those frameworks, okay? Um, Scrum, everybody familiar with this? You familiar with this slide? This should be at this point, you know, where we are 20 years into the Agile journey and Scrum has been around a little bit longer. Um, this should be familiar to people, okay? It's, you know, it's, it's the most widely adopted um, flavor of Agile, okay? So this is from uh, the State of Agile report, uh, most recent one. Respondees say that you know there's 58 percent of respondees are using Scrum as their method of Agile. That's a, that's a huge um, monopoly almost. Okay, and then also you can look at down here. There's 10 percent using Scrum and XP hybrid, which we're going to talk a little bit more about later. Um, but then that kind of aggregates up to 68 percent using Scrum in some shape or form. So that's a lot. Okay, and that's one of those methods of breaking down that problem into, into, into a smaller problem, which enables us to deliver more frequently than we used to 20, 15 years ago. So the promise from Scrum is this. This is Jeff Sutherland, co-creator of Scrum. It's the art of doing twice the work in half the time, right? So who, who doesn't want that, right? Any CEO, any CTO, anyone involved in the business of delivering software, they, they, they're going to sign up for this, right? And they're going to use Scrum as their default uh, weapon of choice. Hands up if you're using Scrum. OK. How many developers in the room, actually, just out of interest? OK. Um, do you like Scrum? There's mixed, mixed responses there. We'll see by the end of this discussion, we'll see where you stand on it. <laughs> Uh, okay, so um, so the art of doing twice the work in half the time, uh, you know, that's a great sales pitch. Everybody wants that. But what's the reality? Okay, I love this picture. It's just you know, like actually, when you lift up the blanket, look, peer behind the curtain. What is the actual reality with Scrum adoption? Okay, so 58% have adopted it. 68% you could you could argue, and uh, and and what's the reality? Are they doing twice the work in half the time? We'll see. So I think Scrum's a slice and dice framework, OK? Chops all those things up. Think back to that Scrum slide a minute ago. It's, it's about chopping things up, a backlog of small stuff, and then we churn through it, OK? It's slicing and dicing. And when I, saw, when I, when I, when I picked this image off the internet when I was putting this together, that kind of reminded me of something. And it was, uh, I, I re realized it was this. Are you familiar with this one? This is like a classic old school Agile 101 incremental versus iterative um, development slide. We'll, we'll touch on it again later on, okay? But, but this is kind of the, the incremental approach, okay? You, you take a big, a big solution, a big problem, you break it into small chunks and deliver it incrementally. And that's Scrum in a nutshell, really. You know, just increment towards your goal. Now, I don't think that that's twice the work in half, in half the time. It's probably the same amount of work, and, and we've probably brought the timelines in a bit because we're working in smaller batches, shorter, shorter iterations, all that kind of stuff, okay? So I'm not saying it's bad. I'm saying it's, it's, it's definitely um, got the kind of half the time part of that promise, but I don't think it's changed the amount of work. I think it's the same amount of work. And in reality, um, so I'm an Agile coach and I, I, um, I work with lots of different teams and I, and I have to kind of initially establish with any, any team I begin to work with how, how they're delivering software, what their MO is. And I've, you know, the next few slides I'm going to kind of show some of, the, some of the common patterns that I've observed in terms of how teams actually do it. So they'll say, yeah, we're doing Scrum, yeah, we're doing Agile. And then once you dig deeper, you start to find some of these kind of anti-patterns, okay? So I'm going to ask you as I go as well, or feel free to, to, to kind of put your hand up and, and, and admit if any of these patterns looks familiar to you. It doesn't have to be your current context right now, but, you know, a few nods if you think, oh, yeah, yeah, I've, I've seen that before, okay? Um, 
because if anything, it will kind of um, make me feel like at least as some other people out there seeing the same, the same things that I'm observing. So I, th I think, okay, with, with this slicing and dicing, I think effectively what we're doing is we're moving the work around. We're not doing twice the work. We're doing the same amount of, uh, same amount of work, but we're moving it around a bit, okay? So this is, um, this is like your classic um, waterfall, develop, test, user acceptance, testing, release, whatever. Okay, there's probably more stages you could put in there, analysis and um, support and all that kind of stuff. But just let's condense it down to this for now, okay? And often um, organizations go agile and they adopt Scrum. And that means you're gonna work in iterations, okay? So that's a good thing. And sometimes you see this. Anyone familiar with this? We've got one, okay, a few nods. So we develop, 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 we're working in sprints, and then we test and integrate and release, okay? So we haven't really changed anything there. We've done uh, the same amount of work, the same, the same work exactly, but we've just sliced it up a little bit more, okay? Um, but it's kind of a step in the right direction, possibly. Um, and so maybe after that, someone might kind of say, well, that still feels a little bit waterfall-y, or you know, um, we, we haven't really made any impact to how we work. So we'll try something different. We'll, um, we should really be finishing the sprint with work that's developed and tested, okay? So then we do develop and test in the same sprint, okay? And we repeat that a few times. Uh, but again, it's not really changing the end to end, right? So it's still the same amount of time, actually. Uh, and we're just moving the work around a little bit more. So then we've moved all the testing that used to happen after development into, you know, let's do a chunk of development and a chunk of testing. Anyone in this kind of pattern? Now, <clears throat> that's kind of what, what's referred to as mini waterfall, okay? Because it's, well, we'll do like six days, six, seven days of development, and then it's all tested at the end, okay? So again, we're, we're, we're shrinking the problem down a little bit, but we're still in this kind of place where um, we're just moving the work around, doing the exact same work. Uh, so we kind of, we, we recognize that. We recognize that that's mini waterfall and we said, well, well let's, let's shrink it down again because we can't leave the poor tester to just take all this download of stuff with three days to go on the sprint and have to test an entire sprint's worth of work in, in the last three days. It's just not, not possible. It's too much stress on the poor tester. So we need to get the testers testing earlier. How do we do that? Slice it up into smaller chunks and deliver smaller chunks earlier so that they can test throughout the sprint. Good, that's a good direction to go in. Anybody doing that? So you're starting to, if you, if you can get to that level, you're starting to you know, kind of get into more of a cadence, smaller chunks, getting test feedback early. And that's good too, going in the right direction. But again, haven't changed the way we work. We haven't changed the work we do. We're still doing the same stuff, just sliced it up into smaller chunks, okay? And again, it's not having much impact on the end-to-end. -end. That's the unfortunate thing. And there's a couple of messier versions of this that I want to point out, which are probably more realistic, and I hope that maybe some of you will, will, will agree. This is where you've got overlaps and carryover, okay? Um, so a developer in this situation, the mini waterfall, develops for six or seven days and then hands some stuff over to tester. Now that's the tester's problem and I'm a developer and I need some stuff to develop, so I'll pick up another thing and I'll develop it. The tester's got no hope of testing that within the sprint, so that's gonna carry over, okay? So now we're getting a little bit more unpredictable about what we can do in a sprint, that's not great, um, but developers are just developing all the way straight through, regardless of those sprint boundaries, they're almost, it's a mockery of the sprint boundary in a way, um, and it's a mockery of the sprint commitment in a way, um, and testers just test continuously. So really, have, we haven't changed how we work at all. Testers test, developers code continuously. Uh, so we're just moving the work around a little bit and putting different boundaries in place that are kind of ignored. And then there's another version of this, which is with the smaller chunks. And again, we get to that same position. Not much time left in the sprint. Developers got nothing to work on. Picks up another story to work on and it can't be finished within the sprint. Now, again, we're not making much inroads into the end-to-end, -end, and when we start disrespecting those sprint boundaries, um, I think what we eventually uh, kind of get is the eventual aggregation of small chunks of work into a sensible increment of software. Okay, so 
And for me, that, that's, that's not agile, okay? That's, you know, um, that's like, well, well we, we've, we've adopted Scrum. We should be doing some, we should be finishing our sprints with something that we could ship. That should be a target. But we carry stuff over. We, we bite off more than we can chew. So we didn't, at the end of sprint one, we didn't have anything to ship. We finished it off in sprint two and maybe a little bit of testing in sprint three. And then eventually we had something to ship. Um, and that's not twice the work and half the time f for me, okay? It's like, it, it's, we've, we're bringing in the timelines, but comparatively speaking, we're just comparing against how bad we used to be as an industry, right? You know, so stuff that, we used to go a year without getting anything um, out from a team, or two years on a big project, or three years and then you can the project, I've been on those. Um, but yeah, so really we kind of get to that point where it's like, it's good enough. It's way better than what we had, and it's good enough now, so, you know, happy days. And I think that this is a big missing piece in the Scrum um, adoption, is people are very quick to adopt Scrum. They put all the bits in, in place, they put all the constructs in place, they do the practices, they do the ceremonies. But this is a bit that I often see overlooked, is the potentially shippable increment, the PSI. One of the things, if you read the, if you read the Scrum material and liter literature and, and recommendations, is you should be, as a team, finishing every single sprint with a potentially shippable increment. If I'm paying for a team of developers and, um, and testers and whoever else that's tag tagged along to that team, uh, if I'm paying for, for them for two weeks of effort, I, I'd, I'd like to think that they could build something useful in that two weeks. It might not be something that's going to change the world. It's not going to, you know, change or shift a market, but it should be some sensible increment of software that, that satisfies some need after two weeks. I don't think that's a huge um, ask. But again, we, 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 we kind of, um, well, what I see, I don't know if you guys agree, but what I see is this is really kind of glossed over the potentially shippable increment until we have something that we can ship, potentially ship. And that's not the game. We're supposed to be saying, what could we get out of this sprint that is potentially shippable? Not let's carry on developing, developers develop, testers test, and eventually when we get to a point when we have something, we can ship something. That's not the game for me. Um, and, I, and I start to question, like, well, why is this? Why are people glossing over this, um, this thing? And here's this guy again. Remember, he was here when we couldn't do something the, you know, earlier on. He's, um, we can't do something. We just can't do it. What can't we do this time? Well, we've got a new problem, okay? So it's like whack-a-mole, right? You get rid of one problem and another one comes up. So I think teams struggle to build a potentially shippable increment of software every sprint. That's a tricky thing, okay? Um, but that's a, that's a real measure of agility. If you can do that, you are really quite agile. You're not peak agile, but you're doing really well if you can get to that stage. And that should be a goal for anyone who adopts agile, in my opinion. <clears throat> so I think there's a, new, there's a new problem there. And that's what I'm seeing. And then I see teams who say, they, t they say to me, we, we just can't do it. There's too much of an overhead. That release, the test and release overhead, the integration testing, performance testing, security testing, uh, you know, kind of... Um, in, yeah, all those kind of uh, long, kind of once-off hit testing phases that we do typically on a big project, um, we can't we can't bake that into every sprint. Um, so how you know how can we do it? And um, yeah, and that's the question that, that I, I kind of turn around to them and say, well, how can you do it? If you carry on doing the work the exact same way that you've always done it, then yeah, you won't be able to make something that took six weeks. You won't be able to take a slice of that and deliver it in, in two weeks. You have to change the way you work. You have to change, learn new techniques, and, um, and that might give you a fighting chance, okay? So, unfortunately, with, well, unfortunately for Scrum, it's not unfortunate for XP, because I think XP has got opinions about this, about how you get to that point, how you enhance your craft, and how you get better as an engineer, uh, or as an engineering team, uh, to, to shrink that work down, and we'll talk about that later. Um, but Scrum doesn't give you any, anything on this, unfortunately. They say, you know, it's up to the team to decide how they want to do their work and they should inspect and adapt and get better and improve their processes. Fair enough, and they allow that autonomy for a team to self-organize and choose themselves what techniques they want to use. 
But if you're adopting Scrum as a new, um, as a, an organization that's new to Agile, you know, you're, you're going to look to your adopted framework for the rules and guidelines about what you're going to do. And if it doesn't say anything about your engineering practices, then chances are you're going to gloss over it and carry on with the ceremonies and trying to, trying to get those nailed and see if, if that will make a difference. So there are genuine and real um, impediments from the organization that are stopping teams from um, delivering potentially shippable increments in a sprint. I'm not, I'm not disputing that in, in the slightest. Um, you know, th th there are big things that will stop a team from being able to, to deliver software in two weeks. Um, here's some of them from, um, these are the most common ones reported from the State of Agile report again. So you can, you can nod or grumble or cheer if you, if you kind of um, you know, hit any of these that are close to your heart. Uh, the company philosophy or culture is at odds with co core Agile values. Uh, lack of experience with Agile methods. I think that's a crucial one, right? So again, you're saying, well, we've ch chunked all this stuff into, up into sprints. We're not really experienced at coming out of that sprint with a potentially shippable increment. So actually, that's stopping us from kind of reaching that level of agility. Uh, lack of management support. Product owner customer isn't around. Um, inconsistent practices things like compliance, governance, all those kind of things could, in some organizations could be a big overhead and it's not something that's um, obvious. How do we bake that in, in smaller chunks into a, into a two week time box and pop out the other end with something that satisfied all the organization's requirements. So Scrum on its own, you know, it's gonna to struggle to tackle all these things, okay? These are organizational impediments. So we're going to need something new for that, okay? And there's another framework is probably what we're going to adopt. Organizations who look at this and say, we've tried Scrum, but we're not getting the benefits. Um, it's because we're too big and our organization has got all these impediments that we need to solve. And something like the Scaled Agile framework is probably more what we need because we're big, we're, we're at scale, and this is a far more suitable professional um, framework for us to adopt. We'd be taking a lot more seriously. 28% uh, of people who do Scaled Agile are now choosing SAFE. Anybody here using SAFE? Got one? One and a half? <laughs> well, we'll see. You might see a flavor of it in a minute that you recognize. Um, Scrum of Scrums, 27%. So it's only just surpassed Scrum of Scrums as a way of scaling Agile up. Um, Scrum of Scrums really is, you know, kind of like that organic approach for, um, you know, We've got dependencies, and we've got things in the organization and in, within other teams that are slowing us down or, or impeding us as a team. So we need to interact with those teams and align. Okay, so that happened organically. Uh, then SAFE came along and kind of put it on steroids and said, we need structures for that stuff. We can't just have teams organically and kind of you know, loosely going around and talking to each other. Um, so we need structures. So this is the safe, um, kind of basic safe template. It's called Essential Safe. Uh, and what it's got is it's got teams, oh, that doesn't work. It's got teams here, but you're probably gonna have multiple teams in an organization. They go through delivering and multiple iterations, but they're aligned to an agile release train, um, which is basically a scrum of scrums, okay? Just in layman's terms. Safe itself has got a few more little constructs and roles and responsibilities for specific people, but ultimately it's kind of a scrum, a scrum of scrums on steroids, okay? And it looks at the program of work, okay? It's saying, well, what a team was working on and what a team, another team was working on, um, well, if we've got lots of teams working on stuff that's all interconnected, that might be a program of work. Um, so that's what it concerns itself with. But then it realizes that organize, there's many different size and type of and profile of organization. So it, they realized they needed more flavors of safe to satisfy those, um, those companies. And so they went a little bit kind of version um, crazy and brought around um, this kind of like um, uh, portfolio level, because that's when you need scrum of scrum of scrums. And, uh, you know, enterprise I've highlighted here because this is starting to indicate that this is at scale. This is an enterprise. This isn't just a normal middle of the road size company with, where we can have just teams doing agile development on their own. We, we are an enterprise. We need more things to tie us together. 
there's a large solution version, and there's the full version, okay? And what you're starting to see is this is starting to, to, to look complex. It's starting to stretch up into the organization. Um, one of the things I like about SAFE in that regard is that it's starting to, it's, it's having those conversations up into, into the organization and out into the organization. That's cool. But the bit that I dislike is that is what's happening at the foundation level where there's teams doing Scrum and, uh, and how are those practices, hap um, how, how good at, are they at those practices before we start scaling everything. Uh, when I was looking for that, when I found that slice and dice uh, slide a while ago, um, I found this one as well, which I thought was kind of, you know, might fit in nicely here because it started even, I think, it, it advanced slice and dice when we start getting into the scaled version of things. It's like, how do we get, how do we break a portfolio, slice it up into programs of work, slice the programs up into um, agile release trains, teams of teams that are going to work on these things. Um, and I just thought that that little box reminded me a bit of that ad agile release train. So it looks a little bit train-like in itself, but maybe that's just me. So, um, <laughs> so we've got new problems again, more new problems. It's whack-a-mole again, um, or whack-a-mole. Uh, another new problem was well, kind of the same problem, but it's exacerbated. So teams struggling to build potentially shippable increments of software in every sprint. But now we've decided to scale that up and, and, and push it out into the organization, right? And, and lots of people are trying to adopt this and are going to copycat what the original adopters were doing. But if the original adopters were not releasing potentially shippable or were building potentially shippable increments of software in every sprint, then we're copying a, a poor pattern, okay? And now that's going to proliferate throughout the organization. So that's unfortunate, I think. And I think it's, it's, it's kind of you know, blind adoption of frameworks are leading us down these, these paths, okay? We, th we think that once we get all these constructs and new labels for things in place, that that's going to have an impact, but it's not, okay? We need to be able to change and improve the way we do our work. Dean Leffingwell, much maligned, he's the kind of creator of SAFE. Um, and to his credit, the SAFE material says you should be doing Scrum and XP. It says Scrum is for project management stuff, right, project management stuff. And XP techniques should be complementing it for the engineering stuff, okay? And when you put those two together, you've got the basic agile building block that you should be scaling up from, okay? But unfortunately, that's really easy for people to gloss over. They think Scrum or XP, we're doing Scrum, that's good enough, off we go, let's proliferate. And also to his credit and to Safe's credit, they say build quality in and use um, XP practices and these are the ones they choose, okay? We're going to talk a little bit more about those later on. Um, well, most of them. Anybody here doing, doing these things? Hands up who's doing continuous integration. Okay. K uh, keep, keep your hand up if you're developing on trunk or master. Checking in multiple times a day to master. Good. Everyone's doing continuous integration. We think we're kind of fooling ourselves. We're going to talk a bit more about that later on. Um, so safe framework adoption, again, it's not really quite cotton to mustard for me in terms of being able to deliver software on a, on a, on a two weekly basis or less. When I started doing um, XP, we were working on one week uh, sprints, one week increments, uh, one week iterations, and that was tough. And we had, to, we had to change a lot about how we worked to be able to release software within one week period. Um, but if we'd carried on doing what we had been doing, there was no hope that we would ever do that. We had to learn new techniques. Uh, this is, um, is kind of a success story from SAFE, actually. Um, that I'm working on at the moment, I think, it's, I think it's success for me, but it's again, it's all about what you're comparing to, okay? So this is a, an organization I'm working with at the moment, and when we started off, these, these are um, cycle times of when features were planned into sprints and then when they got um, accepted by the product owner at the end, okay? So it's, they're not even released, right? But they were good enough for the product owner to accept. And, um, and it's not even about what time they got, they were conceived, which could be even further back again in the pipeline. It's about when we planned them in. So these, these could be things that were hanging around for a year, 
but we only started the clock when we planned them in. Okay, we said, well, once we say we're going to do it, this is how long it takes us before you're happy with us um, with what we've delivered. And um, each each of these um, measurement points is is a PI. Are people uh, in, familiar with that? A program increment, which is it can be anything, but uh, typically it's about five or six sprints worth of work. Right, so you're looking at a quarter of a year. Okay. Um, so we do quarterly planning typically, and so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, there's seven quarters there of results, okay? And going back to uh, January last year, the average time we had was 195 days for a feature to be accepted after it was scheduled in. That meant that it was like half, over half a year in the pipeline being worked on or threatening to be worked on, someone was threatening to work on it. Um, and so that means that PI after PI after PI, you know, this thing was still hanging around, okay? On average, this is average, not the worst one, okay? And by solving a lot of um, what I would call kind of macro uh, concerns, things where the organization was impeding us, okay? We didn't have product owners in place, we got them in place. They weren't getting stuff pipelined early enough, we got them to do that. Um, we sliced and diced, we broke big things down into smaller things that would flow through the system faster, okay? And we did all those things, we tackled all those organizational impediments that we were facing and we got it down to 44 days, which is a huge improvement. Now if I start, if I came in today and looked at 44 days, I would say, oh my god, that's, that's long, we need to do some work here. But based on where we've come from, it's a massive um, win, okay? And, and we're proud of it. Something you'll notice is that the last three PIs, it's kind of plateaued a bit, right? And this is sh safe in a nutshell for me, or blind framework adoption without getting down into the nitty gritty of how you actually do the work, is that you plateau once you solve all those macro problems if you don't know new ways and if you don't learn new ways of doing the work, okay? And this kind of rings through here because this is what I'm observing with this organization is that now we get to this level and we say well, we haven't got too much more fat around the edges that we can trim you start looking inside in the team's practices and you realize that they're doing all those things those patterns i showed and illustrated a while ago which is you know developers haven't changed the ways they they work testers haven't changed the ways they work so we need new ways of working to bring start bringing this in like 44 days and we want that down to 10 days if you want to deliver a potentially shippable increment every sprint so there's lots of work left to do. So are we getting better? Um, question, right? I think we are, we are getting better. As I said, we're at our best we've ever been, but I think we can do so much more. And I think that we focus with the framework adoption on better ways of delivering software rather than developing it. The Agile Manifesto says, you know, uncovering better ways of developing software. Go back and take a look at it. It's developing software is what it says, not delivering software. It's kind of implied. Um, but the delivering, if you can kind of take all the stuff I've said up to now in, in, the, in, in that context of delivering, it's almost the logistics, right? It's like Amazon's um, logistics for getting a product to someone, right? You know, we smoothed all that stuff out, right? But actually, what's in the box? Is the right stuff, and how do we get what's in the box into the box? Um, so this is the thing. I think we are getting better at we've we've gotten way better at delivering, and that's where we've had all our big wins. But the developing is where we need to, I think, get more of this because XP has been around as long as Agile has been around. Okay, there's techniques that I'm going to talk to you about now. They're not going to be. I'm not going to go into technical detail. I'm just going to describe the techniques and some of their benefits, but. They've been around and I think they're being forgotten or just kind of adopted piecemeal by those who are being quite proactive about it. Um, I think this is how developers feel about Agile in a lot of cases. I think they're bored of the process. I think it's just, they're happy for someone else to take care of it. If they've got a scrum master in their team, that's his business. I'll just get back to, to doing my work the way I've always done it. Another ceremony, oh, so many meetings, I hear it all the time. And I see a lot of this in terms of how developers work. And for me, that, that's not agile development. Um, it's, I, think, I think agile has changed the game and software development has changed over the past couple of decades, right? It's a, it's a collaborative 
um, activity now. It's not um, an individual activity. Sure, there are times where everybody needs to concentrate and focus on solving a problem, smashing something out, get the cans on, block out the rest of the world. No problem with that. But if that's all day every day, then that's not agile development in my, in my opinion because there's not collaboration happening, there's no sharing happening, there's no um, shared understanding, there's no learning happening, like, or minimum learning happening. This person is not teaching someone else something, is not learning from someone else that's in the team. And also not picking stuff up on the airwaves that is really valuable as teams are discussing and clarifying requirements and clarifying approaches just in discussion. Um, and the thing that, I often get back from people around this con particular issue is, um, is you know, I just got. Uh, I just, I just want to, I just want to do my work. I just want to code, and I think you know, like that's not the that's not the game we're playing anymore. And I feel kind of sympathy or empathy for someone who who got into programming with the view that this is the kind, this is the kind of way I like to work. And this is an industry that supports that and happy days. And as long as I churn something out, eventually people are happy and I enjoy my work doing it. And I don't have to really do too much interacting with a lot of people. Um, I'm trying not to general, I'm not stereotyping people by, by saying that that's not all developers, but there's certainly a, a proportion of developers who are in that bracket. And now Agile's come along and said, hey, no, we need feedback all the time. You need to be talking to the person next to you. You need to pair program. We need shorter feedback cycles. Like, we need to see what you're doing today, tomorrow, you know, at lunchtime. Let's just get that stuff out there and code in the open. Um, and that's, that's a big game changer for some people. So I understand if, if people are frustrated with that. But unfortunately, the game has changed. And, you know, we, we, we have to kind of find ways around this and also was keeping people happy in the way they work and 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 I think that XP has got a lot of really good techniques for 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 balancing that off okay but I don't like to see this because of the lack of collaboration and the lack of communication and um, and and I don't think it ties in with agile so I think we got new problems again okay more problems that just keep coming so I think agile engineering techniques are not proliferating and I think people doing the work are getting disengaged from the Agile process. As long as it's happening around them, I think a lot of people in engineering teams are kind of happy for it to be a peripheral thing, as long as they can just carry on doing their day-to-day -day work and solving good problems as they go. Um, and why should you be bothered? Right? I mean, <laughs> if, if we've never been this good before, and eventually I'm delivering stuff, then what's the problem? Right? We're as good as we've ever been. What's the problem? Why should we be bothered? That's someone else's problem, the agile stuff. Um, but I think it is a problem. I think that we've, with the frameworks, I think that we have um, just focused too much on the process, okay? Um, I don't think we've focused on the craft. If you're a developer, or if you have engineers in your team, who are doing the exact same stuff they were doing two, five, ten years ago. They've not improved themselves. They've not got better over time. They might have got better. They might get quicker at doing stuff because they've done it so many times. But are they getting better? And what 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 kind of techniques are they learning, which are out there, at get, to get better at the craft, which might then get us into a position where we could do twice the work in half the time. Not just through familiarity with the work, but because we've un uncovered better ways of developing the software. And so there's this chasm in the middle, and I think that XP could be um, a really uh, good um, bridge between the process and the craft, and b between the, the kind of the, the, the process and the engineering side of things, because it should be a joined up um, delivery mechanism, I think. So there, there, there is a gap, and I think it's impacting motivation as well. Don't know what you think, that's my observation. Okay, so. At this point, when I start to think about the motivation of engineers for adopting Agile and buying into, um, into techniques, new techniques, new ways of working, why should I bother? Um, I just want to kind of, um, you know, I, I, was, I was originally going to lead with this initially, just to kind of give you a flavor of who I am and where I've come from. But I thought I'd set the scene first and then say, well, actually, now let me tell you my story about how I started working with XP. So the year was 2004. Long time ago now, um, 
and I was working at Fidelity Investments. I was a um, fairly junior uh, web developer and came off the back of probably second uh, successive failed waterfall project. Um, and this new project came up, which I was just blessed to, to, um, to be invited into the team for, to say, oh, we're putting a team together for this new project. It's going to be this, and we're going to do it in an agile way. Never heard of agile before. What's that? They said, well, you know, we're going to get these guys in from ThoughtWorks. They're like the leaders in, in this space, and we're going to learn all these cool new ways of working that are, um, you know, going to mean that we're going to be able to deliver faster. And I um, said, so, okay, cool. I'm up for that can't be worse than the last two projects I was on. So we started to shed the waterfall stuff, start learning all around the agile principles, um, learning around incremental and iterative development, two different approaches, but two better approaches than the waterfall um, approach. Started to, um, to learn a whole heap of new technical skills, um, different technologies like Spring and Jetty, DBUnit, JUnit, Selenium, but also different techniques. And this is, this is the key part to, the, to this whole discussion, is the techniques, right? So continuous integration, TDD, BDD, these kind of things, okay? So these different techniques, it's not just technologies. But I was soaking all this up. Never, was, never in my life have I been this engaged, and never in my career have I, have I been this engaged in my work, where it was just this constant, constant learning from excellent agile practitioners, excellent technologists, superb programmers, and I'm learning all these things from them. Just, you know, young, energetic, enthusiastic, soaking it all up. One week iterations used to fall in the door on a Friday evening, um, absolutely drained mentally from all the new stuff that I'd, um, that I'd taken on board, but loved it. You know, it was na I, was, I was knackered, but I was happy. Um, and I couldn't have been more engaged, couldn't have been more motivated to come back in the next Monday and go again. And uh, I, don't, I don't see huge amounts of that um, with people in, uh, you know, uh, engineers in agile teams at the moment. And I think that's a shame. Um, you know, again, I, I touched on this. This was very interesting to me. Again, you know, kind of incremental. I think that's that scrum approach, right? But just for comparison, the iterative thing, this was what I learned back in 2004, 2005, was how could you do the simplest thing that works and then iterate on it, you know? Um, so simplicity and iteration, they were like kind of key um, differences to just chopping the problem up and delivering it incrementally. And you might be able to stop earlier with this iterative approach. So it gave you more options and that was good. So new ways of working. Again, this is stimulating, right, for a technologist. And we had just enough process to perform, right? So we were doing XP. This was our, f our flavor of Agile because that's what ThoughtWorks were big into. And... Um, <clears throat> and, and we weren't really overburdened with the process. We used index cards for writing our user stories. Um, they're deliberately small. Uh, you could only fit on you know, uh, just a few lines of, of text to describe what you want to build and what the need is and what the requirement is. And you know what we used to do when we were finished with this? <whistles> Done, stick it in the bin. Rip it up and stick it in the bin. And um, so, that's, that's low amount of, of, um, of overhead for the process. And now today we have people having constant debates within organizations as to whether we should use Rally or Jira for this stuff. It doesn't really matter, it's just a tool, okay? And people who really need, feel the need to preserve all these user stories we've ever worked on for uh, eternal posterity, they're like, you know what? All the ones we did back then are in the bin, so, and we're all still alive. Is it important? I'm going to pick up the pace a little bit now. Um, so if you're not um, familiar with XP, I'm going to explain it to you in, in, uh, really quickly <coughs> as a comparison with Scrum. This, is, this picture is from um, a great blog post by Mike Cohn, Mountain Goat Software Guy, who says, you know, basically, here's a comparison. If you're not familiar with either of them and you observe a team doing XP and a team doing um, Scrum, the process is pretty much the same. It looks the same. So we're familiar with this. XP's got the process, it just calls the things slightly different things. It's got a, a customer instead of a um, an product owner. It's, it does sprint plannings, it calls it the planning game. It does daily stand-ups, um, it does retrospectives. 
So it does all the same things, right? So the, the process is pretty much the same as what Scrum has. <clears throat> this is Martin Fowler, who is uh, like one of the godfathers of extreme programming, like uh, ThoughtWorks chief scientist, um, great title, by the way. And, uh, and he says, Scrum's process that's centered on project management techniques, but deliberately omits any technical practices. And this is where there's a contrast with extreme programming, because it is really into the technical practices, the stuff that helps you to, deliver, to develop better, not deliver better. And he's got this great article, which I've got a link in the, in the deck for, um, it talks about flaccid Scrum, which is when you're doing Scrum, but you haven't paid enough attention to the technical detail to be able to deliver every sprint. So it's a little bit like pointless Scrum, okay? There's no end product. Here's a comparison again. So the outer ring is Scrum, which concerns itself with all the process stuff. XP's got that pretty much the same, very little difference. But then the inner ring, the inner circle, is all these technical practices, engineering practices that help you get better at developing, right? And there's a lot of them. And Scrum doesn't have that. They've both got a set of values. Some of them overlap. Most of them are very similar. But, you know, if you ask me now, how do we do twice the work in half the time, which one of these am I gonna pick? So XP's got opinions on how we're going to do tw twice the work in half the time. Scrum doesn't. It says choose whatever you want to do, make sensible choices. XP's got opinions. It says you should do things like continuous integration. That will speed you up. TDD, BDD, new techniques, refactoring, test automation, build automation, feedback loops, bake it all in, pair programming. You look at the kids this morning. They're doing pair programming, right? This is on trend. This is not old stuff. This is the, if it's good enough for the kids, it's good enough for us, right? makes sense. They naturally, they know that kind of collaborative um, way of working. They're not putting the big cans on and saying, I'll, so I'll solve this problem on my own. They're collaborating. Naturally agile. Um, right, and so these are so just some of the things that XP says you should be doing, right? And if you adopt XP, you're buying into doing these things. You adopt Scrum, you don't have to do these at all. No one's, there's, there's no incentive to do it, right? These are your power tools, right? If you're, if anyone into DIY? <laughs> power tools speed you up, right? You know? So those are some of the pra practices and techniques that if we use them properly and learn them properly, they'll speed us up. Then we'll start to do twice the work in half the time, okay? And these are the things that are helping us to develop software better. This is not about developing better software, although that does come with the huge emphasis on quality that XP um, promotes as well. It says definitely build better software, but let's develop the software in a better way. And we need to learn new ways of doing that, right? State of Agile report, it says, while the usage of XP as an independent methodology continues to decrease, it's below 1%, although we do have the 10% who are doing Scrum XP hybrid, and if Scrum and XP from the process perspective are pretty much the same, I'm going to start arguing that 10% are doing XP, right? I'm going to discount that uh, Scrum aspect of it because it's only a label. They're doing XP actually. And I bet you those are the ones who are de de developing and delivering software um, most um, iterations. Um, so these are engineering practices that are being borrowed from XP. They've been around for ages, since the beginning of XP, probably even before. Uh, you know, unit testing, continuous integration, coding standards, refactoring, test-driven development, acceptance testing, all these good things, right? You know, these are the things, these are the power tools, these are the things that make us get to the point where we can do twice the work in half the time, right? So we want more of this, I certainly want more of this. Um, <coughs> I'm going to go back to the patterns of uh, of delivery that I've observed, I'm going to um, suggest some that we could be moving more towards if we enable ourselves with our practices to work faster without compromising quality. So getting to con continuous delivery, how are you going to get there? You need to be delivering stuff within those sprints, right? So develop, test, UAT, release, whatever other things that, you know, with the DevOps side of things now, you know, any other um, operational concerns, performance testing, scalability, all those things, bake them all in and ship in increments of software that's got all those things baked in. But how do you do it? You've got to do these things to get to that point, right? You have to shrink the technical problem, not just the, the size of the work we're pushing into the team. It's we've, got to, we've got to shrink the work the actual, that the team actually has to do to be able to deliver 
uh, like this, right? And repeat it and repeat it and repeat it and repeat it. And you keep getting better at it and you start um, automating more and more stuff. That shrinks the problem, okay? And then, you know, you could, try, you could try TDD techniques, okay? Where we start writing tests, coding to test. Sorry, that should be development there, not test. Write tests, develop, code to tests, you know, do all those things, start parallelizing the work, right? Because we don't need to do all development before we start testing the work, okay? We can start exploring how, how much of the test effort could we do in advance or in parallel with development. That will speed us up and shrink our devel development timelines. And we could even start pulling in the user to say, you know, let's, you start helping us write these acceptance tests. And that's going to speed us up because we don't have to build something, ship it to you, wait for you to give us some feedback and then tell us it's all wrong. I really f hope that, um, that if anyone kind of adopts XP and if it does have a bit of a rebirth, um, I, I'm definitely hearing a lot more noise around it in the industry now because people are starting to cotton on to the fact that Scrum without um, XP is limited. Um, I hope that people try to adopt these um, techniques properly and learn them properly, okay? So continuous integration, that's, that's, um, that's the GIF flow kind of um, branching pattern, right? You're nodding, familiar. Now, if, if your branch ecosystem resembles an org chart, you're not doing continuous integration. Continuous integration is about reducing the amount of branches you have. Ideally, you're checking in um, small increments of code onto master um, and proving that it works with your automated test suite you know, multiple times daily. Look at Jez Humble, Dave Farley. These are the guys who literally wrote the book about continuous integration. Um, they will say that those are the key things that tell you you're doing continuous integration. So if you've got lots and lots of long-lived branches, you need to go and find out and read that book and understand better ways of working because it reduces your waste. Every branch you make is more work for you because you've got to merge it back to something else later on. So the fewer branches you have, the less work you have. That helps you shrink the work so that you can do more in a sprint. <coughs> unit testing versus TDD. Okay, so hands up if you do unit testing. Keep your hand up if you do TDD. There's a difference, right? I'm gonna try and, um, il yes there is, and I'm gonna illustrate it. <laughs> so, so, and you, you, you might be thinking the same thing, but let's play this out and let's see, see, see what you think, okay? So unit testing, I'm gonna say is, I'm gonna describe it like this, okay? So we, we develop a piece of functionality, uh, and as me as a developer, I, I write some code and I check it does what it was supposed to do. Kind of a bit of a manual check. And I develop another piece of functionality. I check that the original bit works and the new bit works, right? Uh, but that's twice the testing and checking efforts that I've just got there now. So now I do the next piece of functionality. Guess what happens? I go, no, I've got to go back and check I didn't break the other ones, right? So now I'm like, do the next bit. I'm, I'm starting to get bored of all this double checking back on the stuff that I did already. So I stop checking that, right? Now what I'm going to do is develop, 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 develop. And then eventually I'm going to chuck it over the wall to test when I think I'm kind of at the end. You know, I'm guessing I'm at the end. Test is like, well, uh, and then I'll write some unit tests. I'm, I'm writing a unit test for the functionality that I wrote, okay? So that's, that's a pattern I see. It's not, it's not the only way that people do unit testing. I definitely see this a lot, okay? So that's unit testing um, that I see happening. TDD is very different, right? It says write a test that encapsulates the functionality that you want your code to, um, to exhibit. Develop the code for that. Run your test. Hopefully it works. Write another test for another piece of functionality. Do the coding. Run the tests. Push of a button. Off they go, like that. They work. Go again, go again. Easy peasy, right? There's no incremental checking overhead or testing overhead as you scale your, so your piece of functionality up. Um, so you, and, and each new line of code you write is uh, you've got um, confidence that you haven't broken a previous piece. Yes? Yeah, 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 yeah. That, that's the proper loop, yeah, but I'm just, I'm just trying to be a, bit, a little bit concise here. You're correct. Um, but then, you know, I mean, do you even need a mopping up tests activity at the end? If all your tests pass, you've kind of proven your functionality, but 
I'm OK with someone else coming along and verifying that by double checking the tests and running them again and maybe doing a little bit more um, stuff to kind of say, well, because I'm not the person who wrote this code, I've got a more critical eye, I can check a few things that that person didn't do. So, OK, but you sh you sh you're shrinking the amount of work you have to do here, right? This is another way for developers to get more efficient and engineers to get more efficient at how they do the work, OK? Refactor mercilessly. <coughs> this was a, a mantra we had back in 2004 on this team, was refactor mercilessly. Um, anyone familiar with the Boy Scout rule? So the Boy, the Boy Scout rule is leave the campsite in a better place than what you found it, okay? No, you're, you're, in a good, you're, you're being a good citizen, okay? Same with code bases. And we say, well, this code base is a mess. Oh, and I've got to go in and do some work on it. While I'm in there, if I notice some low-hanging fruit, I should tidy that up and make it a, a, a better, um, leave it in a better state for the next person who comes on, which actually could be me again next week, right? Um, so just leave, it, leave the, the coal base in a healthier state. Now, compare this to like, what we've got nowadays, nowadays, which is like, you know, kind of, uh, we, uh, we may eventually um, coerce the product owner into a granting us some time to do some refactoring, which we may eventually schedule in in about five or six sprints time, if we're lucky and if nothing else more important comes up in the meantime. Um, and then we might do a big batch of refactoring and you know, it's not really quite the same as a team of engineers who feel like when we see bad code, we feel empowered to just on the spot, within reason, make it better, and that means our code base is healthier, enables us to make changes with more confidence and more quickly without dealing with a whole mess of spaghetti, and that speeds us up, right? That's a good practice. So we got this continuous attention to technical excellence, which enhances agility, right? And that's from the, the manifesto on the principles, okay? So that continuous attention, and um, Build teams around motivated individuals is what we definitely have to be doing with agile teams. It's kind of like a, a foundation block. And how do you motivate technologists? It's with continuous learning. So my experience is that as I was learning all the time, I was really motivated and engaged. And because I was learning techniques that made me better at my job. And I was seeing the results. And I was tired and knackered and happy. It was brilliant. Um, and so I think that's continuous learning. I think every one of us like, should invest in continuous learning no matter what your role is, even though you don't have to be an engineer. Um, whatever industry you're in, continuously learning to improve yourself, reading stuff, getting outside external sources of information that make you better at your job is awesome. Um, and I think that continuous learning leads to happy engineers, okay? Um, so then moving forwards, I'm gonna wrap, wrap up is, <coughs> Here's what I would like to see, okay? I mean, I think, I think Scrum is just XP without the technical practices, which kind of begs the question, why bother, right? You know, I'm okay with Scrum, but you know, if you give me a choice, we say, well, here's Scrum, which has this process. Here's XP, which has pretty much the exact same process and a whole heap of power tools for you to get better at your job. Which one should we choose? Well, well, that's what people do. They say, well, we're, we're allowed to choose, or uh, Scrum says we can choose whatever we want to do, so we'll borrow these from XP. But I think there's a reason why you should then kind of actually say, well, should we choose XP or should we choose uh, Scrum? Because Scrum is a lot around project management, okay? Project management techniques. All these anti-patterns and problems we have around and arguments around estimating and prioritization and scheduling, they're all project management concerns. When I worked in an XP team, I'm sure we had those concerns. We spent way less time talking about them because we were talking about building software that worked and getting it out the door by the end of the week, right? So actually, there could be a little kind of trick to play in terms of like making a statement that says, actually, no, we're not adopting Scrum because that brings with it a whole lot of baggage that we don't really want to um, deal with. We recognize that the ceremonies are useful, we've got them in XP, and we're making a statement now around actually we value these engineering practices and the quality that we can get from, from applying them. Um, so then, so that's why, why I think you should be bothered about it. So then Scrum focuses on bringing the family. It's the exact same. You've got the on-site customer who's the person bringing the exact same stuff that the product owner would bring. It's pretty much like for like. So all I'm trying to do is plant that seed in your head, right? Okay, think about it, mull it over. 
Um, and safe is only scaled up Scrum, right? So if a Scrum isn't working, no, there, I'm not saying all Scrum isn't working, but if you see that Scrum's not working, why would you scale it up, right? Again, wh why bother? And so based on where we are now, okay, 14 years ago when I, was doing, when I started doing XP, it was a bit radical. The word extreme, that wasn't good, right? People latched onto this no documentation idea. Companies didn't like that, okay? So you know what, it got superseded by things that were a little bit more organization friendly, a little bit more like what we knew in terms of project management, and that became the, thing that, the de facto thing that people copied and adopted. Um, but I think based on where we are now, the industry's improved so much that actually I think there's a really good point to, and a really good juncture to say, hey, when we're thinking about adopting Scrum, maybe we should think about adopting XP instead, because it's got pretty much the same stuff plus a whole heap of extras. And, and I think that that's the thing is we shouldn't just be viewing it as, well, let's do Scrum and then cherry pick the, um, the technical engineering practices when we need to. It's, it's a valid independent methodology. It's actually quite lightweight and it, it puts less emphasis and less value on the overhead as long as you're churning a working software. So what we want to do then is get to that point where we develop software better, faster and happier. And that's what I'm hoping XP techniques can do for engineering teams. So thank you. I hope you go and try it. <laughs>